morning. Happy Lord's Day. I don't know what the response to that. Here, I'll give you one. God is good. Would you stand with me, please, and turn to hymn number 50. We will sing hymn 50 this morning.
God bless both. Please have a seat. And we'll have an opportunity for you to kiss one another a little bit later. Would you uh, get your Bibles and open them to the book of John? And we're going to <clears throat> begin our study um, where we talk about the Word became flesh. Um, I want to say this now, I think, it's more than an announcement. Um, but just in case I forget. Um, appreciate so much when we have this time of sharing a little bit later where we ask for your prayer requests, your testimonies, and your questions. Um, there's all kinds of, of ramifications to the concept if you take them you know, if you take them out and try to make application to them. Um, in the first century, uh, questions would have been perfectly normal. And as a matter of fact, Paul even addressed how it should be done as he dealt with this um, Roman Jewish culture and the separation of the sexes that was that was so prevalent in uh, in the Jewish culture Paul even addressed you know as he's dealing with that concept he even, he even addresses questions so if you if you have kind of the, the that as a background and you think of you know why do you ask we ask questions because that's probably the way it used to have been done. And um, so uh, we had some good questions last week. We had probably had answers that were too long. <laughs> that's not your fault. That's mine. But uh, the uh, say, well, why are questions good? Well, because we get to think about things together and we get to talk about things. And someone else with the same question you know, didn't ask it, you asked it, and now that's all coming out in the open. So I guess I just want to say this to you. Say people are, people are going to come in here and, and they'll say, that's the strangest thing I ever saw. And that's too bad. That's just how far away from what used to be a, a biblical understanding of things. So, all right. So having said that, let's look at the book of John. And we're, we're kind of going to, um, I'm going to do this just a little bit differently today. And we're going to look at some scripture. And then we're going to look at some notes. And then we're going to look at some scripture again. This is entitled, The Word Became Flesh. Andy, my TV and timer are not on. So that's important to some people. Even me. It's even important to me. So this is the gospel according to John. And um, interesting that it, it says that now you have to know that um, none of the manuscripts that uh, that people can look at now have anyone's name on them we'll talk in a little bit about the author here but whether it's Matthew Mark Luke or John none of those gospels do we have one that says I Luke wrote this so Interestingly enough, though, with all of them, they all were accepted. The authorship that we have for them were all accepted within uh, a, a generation or two. You know, we get into the second century, and, and people were, were attributing these books to the particular author. And uh, the titles are also different, because often Bible books, um, uh, with some exceptions, weren't given titles, and the title was taken from like the first, the first line. So, um, without, I can't go into all the detail of that. But um, we we look at these at these other gospels, and uh, which of course is good news 
which is what that you know what that um, what that means. So we we look at, at uh, uh, Luke's, and it, in my Bible it says the Gospel according to Luke. So what do we got? We got these four different perspectives. They are all the gospel, and it's each one of them as they were moved along, borne along by the Holy Spirit. That's our New Testament proof, or our New Testament proof text. Each one of them wrote as the Holy Spirit guided them, and they they wrote that what God wanted us to know about. Now, God, John's writing is a little bit different, and it, we call Matthew, Mark, and Luke the Synoptic Gospels, and, and John stands all by itself because this is done. In a completely different way, which we'll look at here in just a minute. So here we have the gospel according to John. In other words, this is another witness of this good news. Now let's begin right away by looking at chapter one, and let's read several verses. Uh, I could probably spend a couple of Sundays and use all of the time in those two Sundays that, that's allotted to me just to go over these eighteen verses here, and that's what we're going to read, or nineteen verses. Because in the beginning was the Word. And the Word was with God. And the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through Him. And without Him was not anything made that was made. In Him was life. And the life was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness. Oh, listen to this. And the darkness has not overcome it. Now, John wrote that uh, toward the end of the first century, probably about 90 AD. The light has yet, excuse me, the darkness has yet to overcome the light. The light is still the light. Jesus is the, somebody should say that, that <laughs> too early, you know, not warmed up yet, I guess. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. He came as a witness to bear witness about the light that all might believe through him. He was not the light, but he came to bear witness about the light. The true light gives light to everyone was coming into the world. He was in the world, and the world was made through him Yet the world did not know him. He came to his own, and his own people did not receive him. But to all who did receive him, who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God, who were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. And we have seen His glory, glory as of the only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. John bore witness about Him and cried out, This is the one, excuse me, this is He of whom I said, He who comes after me ranks before me, because He was before me. And we'll see that a little bit later as we read it. For from his fullness we have all received grace upon grace. For the law was given through Moses. Grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. No one has ever seen God, the only God who's at the Father's side. He has made him known. So one of the most sublimest summations of the glory and the wonder and the plan of salvation of the incarnation is found in these verses up to verse 19. It's actually a prologue. And in that prologue that John writes to his gospel, his account of what went on, he sums up everything. And he, he does this by introducing God the Son. Um, in the beginning, it's just like Genesis. It's the same, basically the same word. And he talks about Jesus being the creator being life, being light, actually, he specifies it, being the true light. 
He talks about children of God. He talks about rejection by the Lord. It, it, amazing. He says that he was made by the whole world. The world was made through him. Excuse me, I got my words in front of myself. The world was made through him, yet the world did not know him. Again, there's a whole lot that can be said about this. Folks, um, This same John wrote later, and you'll see some themes through, and you might even think of some of those things as you're reading through the Gospels. If you read his epistles, John is very specific. It says, if we have, if we love the world, then the love of God is not in us. So he, he, he shows this conflict right up front. Even though he made the world. The world did not know him. His own people did not receive him. So we'll see this as we move through it. And a lot of what I want to talk to you about today are things that I want you to look for and see and think about as you, as you read through the remaining chapters of this book. Um, he talks here about another birth interestingly enough, that he mentions later in John chapter 3. He talks here about grace and truth, and he talks about seeing his glory, that they, uh, they, they saw. Now, John was one of the three that was with Jesus in the Mount of Transfiguration. So he saw glory manifest that maybe some of the others did. Um, he contrasts Jesus and grace and truth with the law of Moses. And then he concludes by saying that when we have seen him, we've seen all of this, we have seen the revelation of the Father. We, uh, you, you, you could do a whole lot worse just by spending your days in the book of John pondering all that's said here in this introduction and in running the references of the concepts and realities that are here that are, that are then reiterated throughout the rest of the book because he comes back to these things over and over and over again. So it, it's just, a, we don't have this in a lot of the other books and this is just a wonderful thing that, that he, he begins with and it's so full of the, the reality. Um, again, this light came into the world and darkness has not overcome. This light, this one, excuse me, this one who made all of this world came into the world and the world didn't even know him. I, I, it popped into my head as I was preparing for this and um, Jesus <clears throat> continually, uh, continually was conflict, you know, was having conflict with with the scribes and Pharisees, we'll see that, that some of the leaders of the Jews he had conversations with. We'll read that today. But he, as, he, as he was presenting this kingdom and this new thing that they didn't expect, they didn't expect to see a person come and, and be the way Jesus was. They, they had read all those scriptures filtered through their own wants and desires, and their own wants and desires through a kingdom and, and worldly things and political power and all those other things that they, they wanted. They didn't, they didn't expect to see this and Jesus came and, could, and they, couldn't, they couldn't grasp it and they fought with him. And I thought as I run through all this, you know, in the world, he made it and we don't, in the world, he made the world and the world didn't even know it. Came to his own people and they rejected him. And I, I've asked myself, God, don't let me have, I know I do, don't let me have the same blindness and arrogance and pride as those scribes and those Pharisees. And when you're trying to show yourself to me, I, I don't accept it because it doesn't fit with what I think that I know. So verse 19 <clears throat> begins the narration and we're going to jump into that in just a minute, but I want to go back and give you some facts about the book. Now that we have basically uh, covered what the whole book is about, through the rest of the book, John just gives examples of why he said what he said in the first 18 verses. So we'll look at some of that today. 
But verse 19 begins the narration with the ministry of John the Baptist. So let me talk to you a little bit. The author was John the Apostle, and as I mentioned earlier, it was attributed to him from the early days. He was an eyewitness, and he, he saw these things. <clears throat> and when you read the book, you'll find out that he mentions a bunch of the other apostles. So we said earlier, you know, that we've not found a copy of this yet that says, I, John, wrote this. So these are, it's, it's anonymous. It's just been attributed to John. And one of the reasons it's been attributed to John is because whoever the writer was, was a Jew. He knew all about Jewish customs. He knew all about Jewish geography. He obviously was an eyewitness of Jesus, and he listed a bunch of the other disciples. So when he starts listing the other disciples and saying, you know, this guy did this, and this guy did this, and this guy did this, and you can pretty much exclude the guy that he mentions from the guy who wrote. And you're with me here so far. He does define himself as, interestingly enough, as a disciple whom Jesus loved. He does it in John 13, 23, and in John 19, 26. So it's an interesting kind of uh, uh, way that we come, we come across this. And, 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 and we kind of see that uh, tenderness that comes out of John. Perhaps it was because he was very old when he wrote this. We see the same sort of themes and um, uh, tone. If I, if it's, it's a tonal quality, perhaps, in his epistles, where he talks about love. And he he's, he's, he's tends to be more mellow, and we'll talk about that uh, than, than the others. We'll talk about that here in just a minute also. It was written probably about 90 AD. Okay? So about 60 years after Jesus died. Now imagine looking back on something 60 years ago. Um, so I can't, can't elaborate on that. Why did he write? John chapter 20, verse 31, says, I have written these things so that you may know. And I won't quote the rest of the book, but you, the rest of the verse, but you can look it up. He says, I want you to know about Jesus. Well, that will come up a little bit a little bit later. By the way, that's also the theme of his epistles. Approximately 40% of the book of John uh, dealt with the last week of Jesus' life. Starts with his triumphal, what, what's referred to as his triumphal entry and ends with his crucifixion. And the highlight of, of that particular week, perhaps, is this wonderful passage passage from John 13 to John 17 where Jesus teaches his disciples and there's no one around. Teaching in the upper room, teaching at, 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 however you want to, you know, where he washes their feet, where he, he teaches, he prays for them. And so we have those, that wonderful thing in there that's, that's not really covered that way in any of the other Gospels. Um, so, as I mentioned earlier, John was was quite old when he wrote this. And maybe because of his perspective and maybe because he was able to look back and see things, maybe um, because by this time in his life, being more mature, he was able to come from a different perspective. He, uh, he wrote things, uh, he, he covered things that some of the other disciples um, didn't cover. So I'm going to go over some things here. This, my notes, I'm going to just give you some of the stuff here from my notes. It says literary features. So things about this book that maybe are different from the other books. So here's number one. Uh, particularly prominent is its majestic prologue, which we already talked about. Number two, narrative parables. So characteristic, a teaching device employed by Jesus, are virtually absent. So you're, you're going to find very few, if any, parables in the book of John. Now, Jesus spoke in parables. I'm not going to ask you, I'll just tell you. Jesus, you probably know, but because he said this. Jesus spoke in parables so that people wouldn't understand. Okay? Why did John write this book? So we would understand. I already gave you that. 
That's the theme. Joshua, I'm writing this so that you will know. So interestingly enough, there are no parables. Parables are, are diminished. Number three, symbolism and metaphor in the teaching, in the teaching method of Jesus, the temple, the wind, the water, the bread, the sight, the mind, the mind, are pervasive in this. And I don't have time to go through all of it. We'll talk a little bit about that in just a minute. So that's uh, symbolism and metaphors. In other words, this, this is meaning something different. Number four, Jesus' miraculous signs and his teaching are shown as interrelated. For example, his feeding of the 5,000 introduces his self-disclosure as the bread of life given by the Father to offer his flesh for the life of the world. His healing of a man born blind leads to a discussion of physical and spiritual blindness in chapter 9. His physical raising of Lazarus, chapter 11, links with, other, links with both earlier and subsequent discussions of his identity as the resurrection and the life. And I won't go on to read more about that. So, <clears throat> again, John's looking back on this. And, and uh, excuse me. <coughs> John's looking back on this and perhaps has a different perspective. And, and he writes not necessarily this, this, first this happened and then this happened and then this happened and this happened. He writes to tell the, the heart of the story, not necessarily the chronology of the story. So he tells <clears throat> about these miracles and then he goes on and he tells what Jesus was trying to show in those particular miracles. So that was number four. Number five, the Fourth gospel contains the extensive upper room discourse, mainly a monologue, but with occasional interjections from the disciples in which Jesus prepared his followers for his suffering, his return to the Father, and sending the Holy Spirit. And then it's followed by his high priestly prayer in John chapter 17. So five distinct things that are, that are uh, different from this book than some of the other books. Now, I want to give you some other things that John has known about that you can look for, and I hope that you look for those things. Here's some, here's some other things. There are I am statements in the book of John that are emphasized in John like they are in, in, the, in the other Gospels. Number one, the bread of life given father, uh, from the Father, John 6, 35. That's the first one. The second one, Jesus says he's the light of the world in John 8, 12. So, um, we need to focus on what he's saying about himself. Yes, he's the bread, but he also says, I am. I am the light of the world. So he's making specific claims, <clears throat> and he's using, uh, as some believe, the divine name when he's making those claims. Number three, he says, I am the door by which the sheep enter. John chapter 10, 10 verses 7 through 9. In 10, 11, he says, I am the good shepherd who lays down his life for the sheep. Uh, he says in John eleven twenty five, 25, <clears throat> excuse me, I am the resurrection and the life. Interesting. His voice brings back the dead. Number six, he says in John 14, 6, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Amazing. Now, um, I do funerals frequently. And uh, too frequently, I guess. But, um, you have to be very careful. I, I, I'm always, I always try to be very careful about what I say about the deceased person because some of the times I do funerals of people I don't know what, what their eternal state is. How many are with me here so far? <clears throat> Everybody. Everybody, when they die, go to heaven. That's not what the Bible says, but that's what everybody says about their loved one when they die. They're in heaven. And uh, I don't normally contradict that. You know, no, they're not. He's not an angel. God didn't pick him for his garden because he likes beautiful flowers. And, you know, all of that, those cliches that we have that try to give comfort to people when they're really not comforting, you know. Um, uh, he was such a wonderful person that God wanted him there. And uh, <clears throat> that's, a, by the way, a terrible thing to say to somebody who misses him here. 
You know, why did God take from me what I needed? So, all kinds of weird things. <clears throat> Everybody, uh, most people, quote John eleven twenty five, I am the resurrection and the life. Interesting, John fourteen six says Jesus said, I am the way and the truth and the life. And how, what does the rest of that? Mean? No one comes to the Father but by me. The exclusivity of the saving work of Jesus Christ. There is no other way. Now John in his epistles says he that has the Son has life and he that has not the Son of God has not life. So these, these statements, and we've got one more, these, these statements are showing us when, we, when he talks about the door. Not, he says, I'm the door of the sheep. And he says, I protect the sheep. I'm protecting them, but I'm also letting only my sheep in. Can't get in here unless you're one of my sheep. So, the, so there's, there's revelation about himself in all of these. The seventh one is, he says, in 15, one, one through five, I'm the true vine and yielding fruit that's pleasing to the vine dresser, which in this instance is, is probably referring to the Father. So the seven I am statements. Please look for them as you read through there. I already gave them to you, but I know you didn't write them down. So but please look for them as you do. All right, chapter one. Let's go back here. We're going to go through this quickly and look at some of the interesting things that, that we can find here. Chapter one, verse 29. I'm going to read to you about John the Baptist ministry. So this is the next day. And by the way, these first few, uh, <clears throat> first couple of chapters, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, apparently covered a day. If John actually meant a literal day, because that's what he says. He says, the next day he saw Jesus coming toward him. He's talking about John the Baptist. And said, behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. This is the one of whom I said, after me comes a man who ranks before me because he was before me. I myself did not know him, but for this purpose I came baptizing with water, that he might be revealed to Israel. And then he says, and John bore witness. I saw the Spirit descending and sent from heaven like a dove, and it remained on him. And I myself did not know him, but he who sent me to baptize with water said to me, he on whom you see the Spirit descend and remain, this is he who baptized with the Holy Spirit. And I have seen and bore witness that this is the Son of God. So John in that, in that paragraph, the Apostle John, talks about John the Baptist and what John the Baptist's testimony was. I didn't know this guy, but I baptized him. I baptized him, and the Lord had told me that the one whom you see the Spirit uh, descending and resting upon, that's the one. And that happened. And we have the accounts of that. And it says that's why he knew this is the one. He is the Lamb of of God that takes away sin. Now, I can't get into all the detail about this, but you're going to find as you read through this that as Jesus goes here in the next few verses and picks his disciples, he's choosing people who were followers of John, who more than likely heard John say all of this. So this just wasn't Jesus kind of randomly walking along the beach and seeing a guy fishing and saying, hey you, come over here and be a follower. And that guy having nothing better to do in his life and being a complete idiot said, okay, sure, I'll come along, all right? And he followed him along. He's going to be a hot dog or something. That's not what was going on. These guys were listening. They were paying attention. They were following John the Baptist, and they heard John the Baptist's testimony. And that's why you got, you got John's testimony here of what he heard from John the Baptist about this Jesus who was the Messiah. And as you read through this, you find out them going and recruiting others. You know, they get the others, and they said, we found the Messiah. And then they come and then Jesus talks to them and communicates with them and confirms that he is, in fact, who he says he was. So chapter 2, we have this interesting story of Jesus' first miracle, the wedding at Cana. And I don't have time to go through all of this. Uh, I mentioned earlier about symbol, symbols and symbolism and metaphors, and there's all kinds of things that have been written about this, about how everything there meant something. The water meant Judaism. And it became what? New wine. 
you know, and so on and so forth. The interesting statement that you gave us the best wine last. Okay. Well, we know, we read the book of Hebrews, we know that this last covenant is better than the first covenant. So there's all kinds of things that can be written. I'm not going to take time to do all that today. I, I don't have time to do all that. I, want to, I do want to draw your attention, just for the sake of your reading as you move through, verse 11. It says, this, the first of his signs, Jesus did at Cana in Galilee and manifested, manifested his glory and his disciples believed in him. Interesting, huh? So he's there at a wedding. He fills, they fill all these things up. By the way, those things held between 20 and 30 gallons of water each. Okay. He was a kegger, all right? <laughs> so he, he, made, he made lots of wine. And, uh, uh, and when you read the detail, again, there's a lot there. You read the detail, you find out that nobody knew it was water except the servants. And apparently the disciples, when they saw that they poured water in and wine came out, were left, you know, it says they believed in him, you know, they were left there. whoa, you know, which we see throughout the Gospels repeatedly. You know, who is this guy who still is on? What, what's going on with this, you know? And so they, they, it was confirmed, what John the Baptist said was confirmed. First of his signs, now, there are uh, three words in the New Testament that are used in miraculous events. Miracles, wonders, and signs. Okay? So, what does a sign do? It tells you something. That's it. Did you look at my notes? That's exactly what I wrote. That's like the first time in 20 years that's ever happened. It tells you something. Tells you something. So, if, you, if you're driving down the road, and when we get into 1 Corinthians, especially chapter 14, you can, there's a lot of confusion about what's going on in there. I won't get into that today, but sometime we will. It talks about signs and wonders and other things. You're driving down the road. Let's say you're going to Chicago, and you're, you're driving down the road, and you see the big sign that says Chicago. Do you pull over and stop and say, I'm here? I mean, is that it? Take a picture? Here I am. I'm here, folks. Turn around and go back. Now, if you're smart, you probably do. I mean, that's as close as you need to get, all right? But if you're actually needing to go to the city, you can't just stop at the sign because the sign just tells you what, where you are or where you're about to go. The sign is not the thing. So Jesus did signs to tell people something. And he did this sign, and what did he tell his disciples? That he could, he had power over natural things. Remember, John says he made the world, yet the world did not know him. And you know, we, we see him, we, we're familiar with all these things. We you know, we see him raise the dead. We already talked about Lazarus and he spoke and then his voice came out. We see him walking on the water, we see him stilling the storm and bringing calm and peace. We see him with all this authority over the natural world. So, what's the sign here? Folks, it's a sign that he is God. We can get all wrapped up and, and you know, figuring out, well, oh, this is the, all the symbolism here, you know, what the wine is and what the jars are and who the master of the feast is and who the servants were. We can, we can do all that. And that's fine. If you've got time, go ahead and do that. When I go away from that, I want to go away from the man. What a wonderful guy he is. He is God. John chapter 3, just trying to touch. I wrote in my notes, must, and, I, and, and my time's up. So let me give you three things here that are musts, <laughs> all right? Verse 14. Begin with verse 14. He's speaking um, to Nicodemus, one of the leaders of the people. One of the teachers. And he says, As Moses, and as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so the Son of Man must be lifted up, that whoever believes in him may have eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, and whosoever believes in him should not perish, 
but have eternal life. For God did not send his, world, his Son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. Whoever believes in him is not condemned, but whoever does not believe is condemned already, because he has not believed in the name of the only Son of God. And this is the judgment that light has come into the world, and people love darkness rather than light, because their works were evil. For everyone who does wicked things hates the light and does not come to the light, lest his work should be exposed. But whoever does what is true comes to the light, so that it may be clearly seen that his works have been carried out in God. Now it's part of the conversation that he had with Nicodemus. He qualifiers here. So Jesus Christ, God so loved the world that he sent a long begotten son, that through him the world could be saved, but what do you got to do to be saved? You have to what? Believe. So there's a qualifier on this thing. I want you to also notice that he says that the world is already, or was previously, previous to this time, under condemnation. And I don't have time to read him right now because my time's up, but you can read John 3.36 and you can read John 5.24, which has the same illusion, not illusion, illusion. God alludes to it. He says the world is already under condemnation. As a matter of fact, Jesus by himself is the judge. Amazing. His presence and I mentioned this a week or so ago, that, that his, his incarnation, his coming to earth is this line drawn. It, it, it's like this fulcrum, and all of the weight of the world is breaking on it. You know, he says that this stone is here, and the stone will grind fine. So... I'm going to do three things about this from John, from this little passage in John. Why are we to tell the good news? Because when we tell the good news, we can deliver those who are in darkness. So they may believe. Romans chapter 10, verses 1 through 17, talks about the gospel that says the people can't believe unless they what? Hear. And how can they hear unless someone speaks? So we got this, this long passage there in the, in the book of Romans where Paul goes through all of this whole process. So we tell the story, the good news, the gospel, so that those who are in darkness, they have an opportunity to believe. They must hear. And for them to hear, we must speak. So live your lives before people so that you have an opportunity to speak. And when you have the opportunity to speak, speak. And if God tells you to speak when you've had no opportunity to live your life before them, speak anyway. Because it's your words that carry the truth. So, why do we tell the story? Number, the second thing is this story glorifies this God of infinite love. Every telling and retelling and retelling is an allusion to his sacrifice. That God loves us and sent his son. So much so that Paul writes later as he looks back on it that God showed his love for us and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. The third reason is we tell this because it, it, it reveals truth about man and God. The truth about God is his loving, sacrificial nature. The truth about man is that we're under condemnation. Every human being is under condemnation. Jesus didn't condemn that. Let me, let me read it again. Make sure that we understand it. Because some, sometimes we, 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 we skip over this. Verse 17 says, For God did not sin, his son in the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him, whoever believes in him is not condemned, but whoever does not believe is condemned already because he has not believed in the name of the only Son of God. It tells us about God, it tells us about man. Man's a sinner without hope and without God in this world. And God is a loving, gracious redeemer and a righteous judge. John chapter 4. Look at a few more verses here. Again, I'm just picking out highlights. 
Jesus is speaking to this Samaritan woman at the well. Jesus said there, a woman, believe me, the hour is coming when neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem will you worship the Father. You worship what you do not know. We worship what we know, for salvation is from the Jews. But the hour is coming and is now here when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth. For the Father is seeking such people to worship him. God is spirit, and those who worship him must worship in spirit and truth. The woman said, I know that Messiah is coming, who is called Christ. When he comes, he will tell us all these things. Jesus said to her, I will speak to you, and he. Now, there's a whole bunch we could, we could focus on in there about you know, where they worship and who they're worshiping, and we could go back in and you know, Jesus talks about this woman's past. He knows her past. And he uses that as an opening to get her to open up about stuff. And uh, uh, actually, before that, he uses the well and, and, and wanting a drink. And again, there's so much here. Did you know that Jesus got, got married? That's why he stopped at the well. Because he was weary. He should have rised up on the wings of eagles. Because God will renew his strength. Okay? Have you ever met Christians like that? You should just rise up on the wings of eagles. Come over here. <laughs> you know how arrogant. Jesus himself got weary and sat, by, sat down by the well. I, I can't talk about it. I'm going to talk. Sat down by the well and rest. I will say this. She shows up, and he's Jesus, isn't he? What's his goal? His goal is to reveal, to be the, to be the redeemer, reveal the wonderful plan of God's redemptive love, which he does to this woman. And um, when the disciples come back, he talks to them about the hearts. So what are you doing talking to this woman? He said, I want you to pray because the harvest is many and it's time for the harvest now. So guess what? He mounted up with wings like eagles and he did the purpose of God, which of course he was going to do because he himself was God. So, I am he. You're going to get people who are going to tell you that Jesus never said any, never claimed to be God. Well, I gave you earlier the seven I am statements. Here's one. Specifically, she says, when the Messiah comes, and he says, I'm he. The one who talks to you is he. So did Jesus ever claim that he was the Messiah? It sure sounds like he did. He revealed himself to this woman. Now, he, did, he didn't do it to Pilate. He didn't do it to the high priests except when he was adjured in the name of the holy God and couldn't deny the question. And even then he didn't say it outright. He, he, he said enough that they would crucify him. Chapter 5. In chapter 5, I'll close with this, Jesus articulates his ministry. And he's, he's having this conflict with the scribes and the Pharisees. And he's talking about his relationship. Look with me in verse 19. I'll just read a few verses. Jesus said to them, Truly, truly, I say to you, the Son of Man can do nothing of his own accord, but only what he sees the Father doing. For whatever the Father does, that the Son does likewise. So, context, he's having this conflict and he healed a man, and they didn't like it, and he's having this conflict, and they said, how can you do this stuff? And Jesus says, you know, I'll put it in our common vernacular, I only do what Father tells me to do. Okay? So I do what Father shows me. So, you, know, you think that irritated them? Yeah. Because they thought they knew all about God. That great old God. They made my heart tender before you. He thought they knew all about God. 
It says in verse 20, For the Father loves the Son and shows him all that he himself is doing. And greater works than these will he show him, so that you may marvel. For as the Father raises the dead and gives them life, so also the Son gives life to whom he will. For the Father judges no one, but he has given all judgment to the Son, that all may honor the Son, just as they honor the Father. Now, again, my mind slips ahead to the book of Revelation, which again was written by the same God. And you see this wonderful scene in the book of Revelation. I'll close with this. You see this wonderful scene in the book of the Revelation where this angel is holding a book. And, and apparently, in this vision of John, there's this cry that goes out, who is worthy to open the book? The break it seals and open it, and, they, and there's nothing to go around it. And John says, I was in despair because there was no one who could open the book. And finally, the angel said, don't, don't be in despair. Look, the lion of the tribe of Judah has prevailed. And he can open the book. For the Father judges no one has given all judgment to the Son that all may honor the Son just as they honor the Father. Whoever does not honor the Son does not honor the Father who sent him. He says in verse 24, Truly I say to you, whoever hears my words and believes him and believes him who has sent me as eternal life, he does not come into judgment and has passed from death to life. So this, you know, read this carefully as you read chapter 5, and if you've already read it, go back and read it over again. Because Jesus articulates his mission. He tells about his relationship with the Father. You can see in that relationship, and him working that relationship out, that he gets in conflict with these scribes and Pharisees who know it all and who, 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 who can't understand and who are frustrated and who are protecting their, protecting their religious turf. And I, I, I don't know, I can't get into all their motives. I don't know that I, I know them all. Just read this carefully because Jesus is revealing himself. And, and how he comes, how he comes from the Father. This is his mission. Again, there's so much in here. Um, I don't have time to read it. Um, Read it all. Uh, let me close with this. We've made our church services, we've made our gospel about so many things. We've, we, we crowd, we crowd stuff in. Um, we've, we've, churches have been built I'll call them churches. Churches have been built by ministering to people's needs, felt needs. By the way, that's the term that church growth people use, felt needs. In other words, what do you, what do you need today? Okay. Well, I've got a financial problem. All right, so that's my felt need. I got. Maybe you do have a financial problem. Maybe you just got fired from your job. You know. Um, maybe you got fired because you were late 57 times. Okay. How many know the felt need is different from the real need if that's the case? All right. Nonetheless, a person needs a job, so we're going to help with their finances, we're going to do this. So churches have been built based upon felt needs, and they'll say Jesus wants to meet your needs. That's true, but that's so minor, because your needs are going to come and go. Your needs are going to, your, your needs are going to change from year to year, from stage of life to stage of life. You're going to have different needs. And, and that thing that was so important to you, Today is not going to be so important tomorrow because there's something else that's replaced it and then something will replace that and something will replace that and on it will go. And, and while we're dealing with all this deep stuff, the reality of the eternity of the Word who became flesh is, is overlooked in its entirety. And I challenge you to read this book. Jesus talked about this here. He says, you think you read this book because in this book you have your life. But this book tells a who me. Jesus said that to him. This book is the book that tells of me. You're reading all of, you're reading scripture and it's and you're trying to find all of these answers and put all this stuff in place, you know, and, and figure it all out. And it's the book that tells of me.
Would you stand with me? Heavenly Father, as we uh, read through this wonderful book you gave to us through your apostle, I pray you reveal yourself to us. Show us your son and his might. Where he does his signs and wonders. And as we see those things, let us be in awe. Show us your son in his righteous judgment and indignation. Where he confronts those who spread lies and untruth and keep people bound up with their lies and their religious stuff. I dare say in our common terms, their churchianity. Help us see that and let our hearts be purged as we see him in his judgment and his truth. Lord, as we read, let us see him in his creative power and his conquering victory. Lord, as we read, let us see him in his love and his mercy. We're going to read about how he wept. Just a few chapters. He wept at the brokenness and the pain that comes into this world because of sin. We're going to read, Father, about how he loved his disciples and shared everything with them. We're going to read how he was sacrificial and a servant and washed their feet. Open our eyes to see him. I pray these things in Jesus' name. And everyone said, Amen. Would you please uh, stay standing and we're going to sing a couple courses. Would you stand with me? And let's turn to this unknown hymn. Let's turn to hymn number... 363. Are there any other announcements? I didn't ask this. I always do, and I didn't ask it. Yes. That's the most wonderful thing we've heard in a long time. I love cabbage.
please remember what John said. That Jesus is the light and darkness has not, will not, cannot overcome. Now, be careful with this Holy Kid stuff. <laughs> this morning, then. 